We're back. We're live. Marco Mangelsdorf here on Energy 808D Cutting Edge. And so pleased to reconnect with and be on the show again with Jennifer Potter, a.k.a. Jenny Potter, former PUC commissioner and currently with Stratagen, doing wonderful things with them. So great to be back with you, Jenny. See your smiling face here on the Think Tech airwaves. Thank you so much for coming on back. Thank you so much for having me, Marco. I always have a great time here with you and love to educate the public about what's happening in our energy space here in our great state of Hawaii. Well, let's let's dive right in. Uh, always no shortage of juicy energy topics to talk about. And since uh, I live on the Big Island, uh, there's been a little bit of recent news regarding Puna Geothermal Venture, which of course is not too far from where I live here on the east side. And just to give a little bit of background to, to the listeners, so PGV, a geothermal power plant, has been operational since 1993. There was discussions kind of mid-80s that started here on the island about geothermal as a possible power source. Finally got up and running 1993, 30 years ago with a, uh, a hiatus, uh, thanks to Madame Pele in 2018. They've been back online now for a couple, three years, and they've been a major supplier, provider of renewable energy into the Helco grid over the decades. And I haven't actually crunched the numbers, but I got to believe uh, there were uh, a gazillion or at least many millions of barrels of oil that did not have to be transported here and burned in a combustion power plant because of PGV. So I, I favor PGV. I find it to be an important component of a stable grid here on the Big Island and getting us to that uh, promised land of 100% uh, renewable uh, power generation in 2045, which is only a scant 22 years ago. And there's been discussion, of course, uh, as of late, about a, a new power purchase agreement that would allow PGV to go from its current max output of 38, which, by the way, they have not hit since the eruption in 2018 there, I believe around 25 megawatts, but they've have approval, a private prior approval going back to an amended PPA in somewhere around 2011, 2012 of memory serves to go to 38 megawatts. And then the new PPA, which of course you're familiar with, uh, would allow them to go up to 46 megawatts. And just uh, as of note as well, uh, the first 25 megawatts as I understand it, uh, PGV receives compensation from Helco at the so-called avoided cost rate, which right now, I looked it up yesterday, about 19 cents a kilowatt hour uh, for both peak and off-peak within you know, two or three tenths of a cent of each other. And just interestingly, last year, avoided cost went up to 30 cents a kilowatt hour. That's the highest I've seen uh, for a long, long time. And the lowest has gone down to is about nine cents a kilowatt hour. So what it costs, as you know, well, tracks depending on what the price of oil that is being paid by the companies, Hawaiian Electric, to uh, private suppliers. So it's not in the, not in the rate payers' best interest, of course, to have any energy source pegged to the price of oil, especially since the likelihood of the price of oil going up over time is, is more likely than not. So uh, I could go on for a while, but I think I'll kind of bring it to a close here. The, the, the current PPA is pending approval for the commission. Uh, according to documentation I saw as part of the docket filed back in April-ish, PGV has roughly, or they've stated they're going to provide the environmental impact report Q3 of this year, which is coming up. The accepting agency, I believe, will be County of Hawaii. And then let me just kind of ask you a question here, Jenny. So this particular E. IR is first provided to the County of Hawaii, and do they and the commission both have to approve the CIR in order for the commission to conceivably move forward with uh, approving the amended and revised power purchase agreement? Luckily, no. So the commission really did look for an entity that was going to be the accepting agency for the environmental impact review. So that was a process that actually took quite a bit of time because it's a very lengthy process that requires a lot of resources for a, an agency to take that on. And the, the commission did not feel that it was it had the, the um, qualifications to oversee an environmental impact review. So they um, re reached out to the county of Hawaii and asked them to be the accepting agency for that review. 
they will be ultimately the approvers of that and make a recommendation to the commission to proceed or finally approve the uh, PPA as it, um, if that was the condition back in March of 2022 when we approved that original PPA. Um, since then, there has been an, a first amendment that has been filed. So that kind of convolutes things a little bit because we did a conditional approval of the PPA based on the outcome of the e IER. And then they subsequently filed a, a first amendment to that in, in reflecting some of the supply chain, the global supply chain issues and um, challenges that they were having getting getting the resources that they needed to, to get the plant back up and running. So. Okay, well, I, I thank you for the clarification there. So last week, uh, one of the, the lawyers, I believe, from uh, well, regulatory uh, departments of uh, of Hawaiian Electric sent a letter that was made public uh, to the commission, essentially putting the commission kind of on notice that, hey, you know, there are delays at PGV as far as ramping up. And what is the import, if any, uh, on that particular letter? Jenny, can you, can you explain, please? Sure, absolutely. So I, ultimately what they asked for is a stop of the procedural schedule. And so what that means is ultimate, there, there, there won't be a decision that's made in, in, in time right, for the clock to, so ultimately there's like the, the clock begins under the contract conditions for PGV to meet certain milestones as soon as the PPA is approved. When you stop the procedural schedule, you're essentially stopping that clock of performance as well. So that means that PGV isn't going to meet those performance standards in the same timeline that we had expected it to. So uh, ultimately, it's it's like a full court stop. And I, I prefer to think of it as a pause, right? A pause. Stop seems a little <laughs> bit ominous, right? And, like and, and as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, once the commission were to approve an amended and restated power purchase agreement between PGV and the Hawaii Electric Light Company. Uh, is it true that PGV has uh, three years, a maximum of three years to bring their output to that stated 46 megawatts? That is correct, yep. And what if for some reason they ran into drilling issues or a Madame Pele event or force majeure uh, that would that would preclude them from hitting, uh, from meeting that that requirement of getting to 46 megawatts within three years after approval. What would be the consequences? Well, the companies could actually terminate the contract uh, with PGV um, if they were not able to deliver under the terms of the revised uh, First Amendment. So that would be um, uh, that would put the energy mix on the big island in a quite an interesting place um, if that were to occur. So we would hope that there would be um, some compromise and some dialogue that happened between PGV and, and of course, Hawaiian Electric Light. So um, definitely. <laughs> and of course, you know, what brings to mind as well is that during the uh, long, long saga of uh, Puhonua, Honua Ola, which we're both very aware of, mm -hmm. is that there were um, uh, failure on the part of Huhonua a number of years ago to meet contractual obligations. And Helco, as per their right by contract, terminated the PPA, which caused a lawsuit uh, in federal court. Huhonua is suing Hawaiian Electric. And then that led to the, uh, uh, the last PPA, which was approved under Randy Ige's commission. And, you know, the rest of that is history. So my point simply is, is that there is a precedent on this island for the utility company to cancel a PPA for non-performance. So I'm, of course, very much hoping that's not going to be the case with uh, with PGV and Helco. So moving right along, let's move uh, over the, the, the island chain, hopscotch over Maui and Lanai, and land on Molokai, which is so near and dear to, uh, to my heart and yours as well. So how about giving us an update on what the efforts are, progress made, uh, challenges as far as the community there, which has been uh, very active and trying to gain more control over the power generation uh, on the Friendly Isle. That's, yeah, this is, this is quite a hero's tale, in my opinion. What, what Molokai has done is really groundbreaking in terms of how a community comes together and, and really organizes itself to 
to put a stake in the ground of how they want to see their energy future unfold. Um, so what they've done with the help of Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, which is located at the University of Hawaii, and also PNNL, um, they've, they've created what's called the CRAP report. It stands for the Community Energy Resilience Action Plan. And what they've done is they've looked at the system as a whole and looked for areas where there's pukas and then areas where there's opportunities to strengthen the resiliency of that grid. And then what kind of resource mixes that they'd like to see on the grid that would they be able to establish firm, you know, a, a reliable resource that could serve the entire island which right now, under the certain circumstances, there are some homesteads and areas that are just incredibly vulnerable to power outages. They do not have the resiliency that they need. Um, some of the homesteads do not have electrification at all. Um, and so they're looking at opportunities to really expand the electric system in a way that's renewable, it's clean, it's consistent with the values and the morals of the, of the Molokai community. And so what they've done, not only putting this report together, is come up with recommendations that, that are applicable to at the state level with the PUC, at the county level um, with the Maui County, and also within their own hui and their community members and other stakeholders. So they've identified actions that each of these entities can take in order to further the, you know, the, the, the vision of Molokai's community um, a renewable energy action plan. So they've, they've done a tremendous job of getting a, a consolidated voice from the community and really formulating a solid action plan that I think can take them, take them a long way. <laughs> because really what they've done is they said enough of having the utility plan our future and tell us how we need to you know, look at energy within our, on our island and what kind of resources would be deployed and where they would be deployed. Because during the CBRE, the um, community-based renewable energy process, they actually came to the commission and said, look, we want to understand what the process is here. How do you guys make decisions? How are these RFPs approved? How is it that we go through you know, this, this, how can we get involved in a way that's meaningful and where we can actually have an impact? And so sitting down with community leaders, with state leaders, and asking those questions and coming up with a hui and a community that, that it stands behind that hui and the co-op and saying, okay, how is it that we can start planning for our future now instead of having the, the utility do that for us? And so this 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 community um, energy resilience action plan is is the outcome of that effort, which has actually taken about two years. And the first step that this community took was under this community based renewable energy program, where they provided two proposals to the companies about projects within areas that they felt were better and would better serve the community than the ones that the that the the utility had selected. Um, for and, and basically had an, a land RFQ, if you will. Like so, those those were company-owned properties. They wanted to build renewable projects there. The, the the community said, "Look, those are in areas where it's a flood zone. We can have tsunamis, and it'll take the entire plant out. This isn't a good place to do it." So they were able to weigh into that process. They were able to weigh into what they wanted to see within the RFP and changes to that, including community benefits um, packages. So that there, you know, in, in terms of developing sites that are next to community members, there would be a benefit to those community members, such as workforce training that would be local individuals that could actually work on these projects in their community and help maintain and service them and even develop them. So they have done a really comprehensive job to look at how energy impacts their economy, how it impacts the environment, how it impacts their community morals and values. And it's just a tremendous, I mean, I can't speak more highly than this organization. They've just done a tremendous job of taking community leadership and really steering the way to, to pave the path for their for their energy future. And I hope that it falls, um, I, they did turn it into the PUC on Friday. So it is uh, actually now in the PUC's hands for consideration. So really excited to see how the PUC looks at this and what they decide to do with this. So good job, Molokai and, and the Hui there. We're super proud of you. Um, excellent work. Well, thank you so much. That's a great uh, enthusiastic update. I really appreciate that. And you know what it brings to mind, Jenny, is if I remember correctly, one of your first ever votes on the commission in 2018, to scroll back a little bit, uh, you may you remember a company called Half Moon Venture, which also 
to their credit, in my opinion, put out, put in quite a bit of energy into trying to get a local buy-in, multiple meetings. They hired a number of uh, Hawaii-based reps. They actually signed a deal with Maui Electric Company, power purchase agreement for power plant, PV power plant and storage there at the Palaau, the single uh, one and only power plant on the island. And ultimately, the PPA was, and you voted, if I remember correctly, you voted with reservations, but you voted yay nonetheless, because uh, you believe that the benefits outweighed the negatives. Mm -hmm. And then uh, at some point after that, uh, Miko canceled the PPA, claiming non-performance of the power purchase agreement to which Half Moon said, uh, you guys delayed us and delayed us and delayed us. And then you're canceling the contract. Well, that's not right. So there is an ongoing lawsuit in federal court, which I don't have any current update on uh, between Half Moon and Maui Electric. So uh, of course, you know, I hope very much that this uh, second go around, the second iteration with uh, uh, more community support, uh, seemingly uh, Hawaiian Electric buy-in mm -hmm. to date uh, reaches fruition. And we're talking about, as I understand it, about a two and a half megawatt or so solar array near the power plant of Palau, 10 or so megawatts, uh, megawatt hours of storage, and then somewhere around 300 kW or so with storage up in the Kuala Pu'u area. Uh, by the rec center there. So let me ask you, kind of on a, a scale of one to 10, given that you and I both know how challenging it is to bring projects like this into fruition, and actually throw the switch at power flow, uh, what's your level of confidence that uh, this is all going to work out this time and there will actually be a community-owned solar plus storage, two locations that will provide Molokai ratepayers and residents the benefits of lower cost, clean solar power. How confident are you? With this community and the action that they've been taking in order to try and harness, you know, the, these opportunities, I'm, I'm very confident that this will move forward. Um, they're, they've just, this is what they want. Uh, and they, I have a feeling that they will fight for it. This is, this is, they want these renewable projects to go in. They also see the savings that there are opportunity there with the solar, um, the solar and battery projects. And so they're, they're excited about that opportunity as well. So I, I do believe they'll move forward. I hope that the utility is ex excited as I am about getting these projects installed. So that would be, um, you know, that'll be really the saving grace, I think, if, if they move quickly. And, and ultimately, that's what the community is asking for, is, is for the utility and the PUC to move quickly on these projects and so that they can get them installed and in the ground. And because we know that these projects take a long time and on Molokai, it's even more challenging. So uh, ultimately, yeah, they, they're looking to see some, some quick moving action from the utility and the commission to hopefully. So it's certainly a good sign, as you noted, that uh, from, if I understood correctly, that uh, there has been a PPA that has been submitted now officially to the commission, which, of course, you know, took the usual haggling back and forth right by the parties. Yep. So it's now in the commission's hands. And then kind of by statute, of course, Dean Nishina and the CA will uh, chime in on it as far as this is in the best interest of ratepayers, uh, residents of Molokai. And I think uh, the number of interveners on this docket is is very small, right? I mean, that doesn't stop anybody. Or, I mean, anybody can, can submit public commentary, right, on any docket. But as far as the official interveners on this particular uh, docket, I mean, there, there aren't going to be too many. There aren't too many uh, seats at the table, right? That is correct. Yeah, I, I I don't remember the number, but I do I do remember that it is a small group that's actually participating in the CBRE docket. Yeah. Well, I can tell you. I mean, having done projects on Molokai now for the past, you know, already sixteen years, both residential and larger commercial, that anybody, any contractor, any developer who uh, looks to get into Molokai uh, and hasn't done it before. Uh, you can game out uh, multiple contingencies. You can put fudge factors in in terms of costs and so forth. But I mean, 
uh, it, it's, it's a real challenge doing anything of note on that island just because of so many uh, so many challenges. So uh, mm -hmm. I wish them, of course, Godspeed and goddess of speed to uh, that they make progress as, uh, as, uh, as quickly as possible. Okay, so that, that's, that's great too. Anything else you wanted to uh, add on Molokai before we uh, leave the friendly island? You know, I think that they're setting a precedent for uh, so many states, so many communities, and in particular, those even like tribal communities that can, this is, this is really a strong stance that they're taking in terms of trying to shape their energy future. And in doing so, they're taking a lot of the, the challenges that we have with when fighting these community-based renewable projects or just community renewables or utility scale renewables. There's challenges that we run into with communities that say, we don't want this in our backyard, or you weren't listening to us the first time that we were talking. The, these types of action plans are the exact thing that we need within the state and, and throughout the country for that matter, to have the voices at the table so that we can hear these, these concerns in advance of trying to cite these projects where we might see opposition. We could be avoiding lawsuits and dragging on these projects that, you know, I mean, I know that, that there's some here in, on the island of Maui that have been going on for years, since 2018, um, and those, the, or 2019, and those lawsuits are tying up, you know, whether we develop solar projects on the island of Maui. And that, you know, when we're talking about trying to meet in, to, and reduce carbon and to meet our RPS goals and all of those things, these types of stoppages are not, um, are not helping us meet those objectives and those goals and helping us fight climate change. Ultimately, we're, we're fighting in courts instead of having listened in advance of actually building these things or proposing these projects on these properties close to communities. Then those are, those are the voices that we need to hear in advance. So I would encourage you know, community groups to continue to step up to the plate and be an active participant and state and local planning. Um, and that, that, that's just going to help smooth the ride a lot for, for the rest of us, you know, as we, as we try and meet these, these very ambitious goals. And to be clear, and if I'm not, please correct me, the, one of the real and tangible benefits to ratepayers on Molokai, once this system, these systems are up and running, is that they as if they choose to be subscribers, if they choose to be subscribers uh, with our two or with the hui, mm -hmm. that they will receive a portion of the output of these solar systems at a cost which will be lower, likely be lower, positively lower, absolutely, that I'm not sure, lower, than what Maui Electric would charge them. That is that correct? I mean, that's that's of course one of the you know a lot of people. Oh, solar is great, yeah, but what's it going to do to my bill? You know, I'm paying 350 bucks a month, and I have to choose between paying the utility bill or keeping food in my pantry. So, I mean, that is really one of the kind of bottom line benefits to residents of Molokai. Is that correct? I agree completely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, so let's move to the uh, the smart area of smart DER, smart DER, distributed energy resources. Uh, how about giving us a quick intro, Jenny, on the nature of smart DER, why people who aren't policy and utility and energy wonks like you and I are, why, why residents of Hawaii should care, and then what new developments on the smart DER drama that you have to report, please. Well, I, I can only speak that, you know, DERs are, are absolutely one of my favorite things <laughs> um, because, <laughs> because they are distributed and, and that's truly the future to me. I, I, I think that we have a distributed future. It's not going to be centralized. Our power will actually be spread out across our grids and again, consumers will be paying a big part of that. So how we actually open the door for our residents to start playing in this energy space and saving money on their bill and participating in programs that help help stabilize the grid and provide grid services and, and ultimately reduce costs to all ratepayers because of their, of their actions of, of adopting solar and, and participating in programs like demand response where they're shifting their load from the middle of the day to the or from the evening to the middle of the day. 
And so those are the types of activities that, that strengthen our grid and help us become more diversified and resilient. And that's, that's really what's critical. The economy in Hawaii also relies on stable uh, you know, programs for distributed energy resources. We have a, a really prolific solar and, and battery programs here. Our vendors are, are often, you know, they're, we're installing, we have thousands of tickets in the interconnection queue um, for, for people that are looking to set up their solar system. So having a strong DER program is critical. What we've had for the last, um, I, don't, I don't know how many years you might know, is uh, interim DER tariffs. Do you, do you know how long those have been in place, Marco? Now I'm going to guess, uh, you know, five, five or six-ish, maybe even longer. Okay, yeah. So in 2019, the commission opened up docket 2019-0-0323, which is a DER and uh, docket, so our distributed energy resource docket. And that was intent uh, to basically, we were looking at not only the IRP, the Integrated Resource Plan, or IGP, the Integrated um, Grid Planning Process, and looking at some of the capacity shortfalls that were occurring um, after the closure of the coal plant. And so the idea was, how can we get distributed energy resources to step up and fill the gap? And so we created an interim program called the Battery Bonus Program that incentivizes the adoption of batteries so that they could actually help fill, fulfill some of that capacity problems that we were having. So there was a significant capacity shortfall, um, approximately 150 megawatts. And so we determined that if we could install 50 megawatts of distributed energy resources, then that would help us fill the gap and reduce the, 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 the potential for an outage by a significant amount. I mean, we would literally reduce it to almost nothing. So the idea was really trying to encourage these DERs to come online. So in doing that, we said, okay, this is an interim. Now you need to build com companies. You need to build a new DER program, a smart DER program, a bring your own device type program. And then we need to get those in place as soon as possible to help us, you know, build certainty within the industry so that consumers have they know what they're going into. They know what their payback period is when they're purchasing these types of systems, which can be quite expensive, upwards of $50,000. And they need to know how quickly they're going to be able to pay that off with the energy savings and demand response participation. And so those having programs that are permanent and in place, knowing that they're going to last for 10 years or 20 years, that provides certainty to the industry and to consumers that they know, you know, what, what will happen and what will be what program they're signing up for. And so interim programs will be going away at the end of next January. Um, and then we'll see the new tariff come into play in November 1st of 2023. And so the battery bonus program, which is currently in place right now, will end as of October 31st of 2023 and be replaced with a very similar program, which is will be the, the Bring Your Own Device program. So that will have an upfront incentive very similar to the Bring Your uh, the Battery Bonus program. So really important to just providing that certainty to consumers and to the industry, uh, solar developers, that they know what they're signing their customers up with. The customers know what they're getting into. This is, this is really critical that we have these things ironed out as quickly as possible so that we can move forward and, and really get that, you know, start planning for how these DERs are going to provide services to the grid and they're going to help us with some of these capacity shortfalls in the long run. Oh, wow. My, my mind and head is bursting Sorry. with everything you just shared <laughs> with me. So just to kind of uh, briefly summarize, so the SMART DER program goes live on November 1st. <laughs> From November 1st to the end of January, and by my calendar, that's uh, November, December, January, those wishing to uh, go the uh, DER route, as in typically rooftop PV and or with storage, uh, they will have uh, a number of options during that uh, three-month uh, period where they can go with uh, the uh, existing customer grid supply plus. Mm -hmm. They could go with customer self-supply, CSS. And they will be able to go with, have the choice of the Smart DER uh, program, which mm -hmm. we do not know uh, what those compensation rates are going to be. We do not know what kind of value will be provided or payment from the companies to those who opt into the BYOD program as far as distributed storage. So we know uh, the launch date, assuming it's not pushed out yet again, 
uh, in um, what's uh, less than four months, but we don't know any of the details. So, you know, I'm thinking of it from the perspective of uh, my company and other integrators across the state, you know, once word gets out and, and this is, you know, it's inevitable. It's not so much I'm complaining as I'm just observing that uncertainty in the marketplace can lead to kind of a, a pausing and freezing of consumers launching into a major, major purchase, which of course PV plus storage is. Yes. So, you know, once the word leaks out, you know, there's there's the typical consumer, oh, if I just wait a little bit longer, I'm gonna get something better, that's right? right. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that's not gonna be the case. And I'm hoping as well that it's not going to be on October 31st uh, that the companies will be putting out the details or the commission will be putting out the details in a, in a uh, decision order, you know, that we'll have some time, uh, substantial time prior to November 1st uh, to kind of wrap our head around this. Yes, absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. We do not want last minute <laughs> decisions. <laughs> and I just wanted to share this with you as we wrap things up, Jenny, because a colleague of mine brought this to my attention uh, last week it was either in Clean Technica or one of the wire services that deals with energy. So you're familiar with ERCOT, right? The Electric uh, Electrical Reliability Council of Texas, ERCOT, which is kind of a grid into themselves because they've opted, Texas has opted not to really be connected to the transnational uh, transmission grid, right? And so they, they're going in the direction of VPPs, virtual power plants, which uh, is tapping into uh, residential, commercial, solar plus storage, right? And at some point last week, yeah, because as you follow the news, I mean, the heat across much of the uh, mainland, especially the south, going from Arizona, going east, Texas, Oklahoma, into Florida. I mean, it's not only hot, hot. I mean, it's dangerously hot, right? And you know, yeah. I both know that when it's dangerously hot, people crank up AC to try to survive, right? So it's record demand for power generation. And Tesla has apparently come up with some type of entity called Tesla Energy. And they, what they do is apparently they're aggregating owners of, of power walls. And I know something about that because I got a couple of my house as well. 13.5 uh, kilowatt hour per power wall uh, per, uh, you know, different homes. So the punchline here is at some point last week, Jenny, uh, the utility company or some type of uh, ISO uh, uh, comparable uh, trader dealer organizer manager was paying up to five dollars per kilowatt hour five dollars per kilowatt hour so some guy who owned a couple of power walls was arbitraging this and he said yes to yes i will sell power for my power walls and he made 150 dollars in a single day <laughs> allowing his battery to be tapped into by said utility company because the utility company was in such desperate need of power. I mean, isn't that wild? Can you imagine that happening in Hawaii? I mean, that's utility really companies, crazy, 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 crazy. That is, that's remarkable. Absolutely. And I mean, they're not even valuing resiliency. I mean, when into that, it's just capacity. So, you know, that that's an inter, I wonder how they came up with those numbers. $5 a kilowatt is it? $5 a kilowatt. Hour, That's I mean, lots. blows my mind. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, my mind has been blown in a very good way being back, uh, you and I together today, and always such a pleasure. We always go, uh, I think, in very interesting directions. And uh, thank you so much for coming on back to this giddy up roundup for uh, you know energy in the 808. And uh, I hope I can uh, count on having you again soon because, as uh, you and I both know, there's uh, never a shortage of interesting energy stuff to talk about. So one, uh, Jenny Potter of Stratagen, mahalo nui until the next time. Thanks so much. Mahalo nui. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching ThinkTech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.